show of 5Shark Fam, I'm AJ, and this is Michael. Before we get into it, become part of the notification squad by hitting the bell next to the subscribe button on YouTube. Welcome to another episode of Five Stripe Weekly and Atlanta United. They drew FC Dallas 2-2 on Saturday night at Toyota Stadium. And before we get into too, too deep into that review, uh, yes, we have revamped our Patreon. And thank you to the new members of Niall Faruqi, Andrew Rowicki, and Gavin Marshall, and also Jordan Beck for staying on steady solid but uh yeah of course michael weiss as well but uh yeah in terms of uh yeah the patreon there's plenty of new fun things in there including when we do live streams you can choose the punishment that we have to partake in on the wheel of forfeit so definitely a lot of exciting things you can check it out in the description below or go to patreon.com slash ATLUTDFANTV. But let's get into that review. And yeah, LA United, we fared pretty decently against uh, the Western Conference, uh, probably because the Western Conference is a little bit crappy this year. But uh, yeah, the... Uh, the marker against, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, Eastern Conference teams, there are a, f a lot fewer points in between from three to nine, but uh, Western Conference, a little bit bigger gap. But FC Dallas, they did play Inter-Miami pretty well before uh, this match in terms of a few matches before this. And so, you know, they've been on a good run, uh, especially it was a decent League's Cup showing as well, but... Yeah, uh, you know, this match, we, uh, we, we, we look pretty decent, but, uh, I think I would say this is, this is that type of, uh, you know, that type of match where on the road, we, we pull out some sort of, uh, some sort of result that we weren't really getting in past years. I think probably in part due to the new players that, uh, you know, actually, uh, have been brought into the side, but as well, this starting 11 left a little bit to be desired for some people as, uh, yeah, you know, you have rotation, you have uh, some of the players that you would hope to have started, did not start, but Saba Labsenitze, he did, and boy, did he have a match, but let's get into first your thoughts, Michael. I've, uh, I've talked for long enough a little bit to <laughs> intro this. Let's get your thoughts uh, on a quick little, maybe intro uh, summation of this match. Yeah, uh, so a quick little summation. Uh, I'll try my best yeah. to, to use some brevity. Um, so I guess this was a good, this is a good game overall. Um, we tied away, we got points away against a traditional playoff team in the West. They may fall out of the playoffs this season um, in that I think when we played them, they were in ninth place, which is just on the cusp. However, you know, traditionally they've been a pretty feisty, good team. They've been tough to get points from away. Um, granted, like we are, I think it was like, if I remember correctly, don't quote me on this, but I think we we're like four, zero and two against Western conference teams this year. Very good record against them. Like AJ said, they have been, sh their whole conference has been a bit of a, a struggle bus for the whole season. Um, that like everyone's taking points from everyone. No one can really get super far ahead from anyone else. There's no, there aren't that many clear cut top echelon teams in the West. Whereas as compared to the Easter, it seems like half the dang conference is like a top comp uh, competing for a playoff spot team. So it's far more competitive in the East this year. Um, so yeah, we played against, um, a, kind of a full a fully functional dallas team where our team on the other hand was slightly rotated and we got to see a little bit of the old Atlanta united from the beginning of the season and the um seasons previous and that showed us kind of like how far we've come we've seen you know what that team does and how they kind of get spanked in the midfield and it happened again because we employed sosa and osetu and that just doesn't cut it or say not anymore but yeah Sadich, right, sorry. Yeah, and Michael, yeah, so, I mean, FC Dallas, uh, I mean, they jumped out to an early lead, which 
uh, made it really difficult, uh, at least for us to get a stranglehold into this match. Because, yeah, so is the Sadich. Uh, them in midfield kind of gave us the flashbacks, uh, PTSD even, of uh, just the poor displays in midfield and the lack of connectivity. And especially kind of pretty much letting some players just waltz through. And uh, essentially they did that through that uh, that first goal. It was a quick and early lead. Jesus Ferreira, uh, yeah, yeah, started some uh, very good high pressure. And uh, yeah, Miles Robinson, uncharacteristically, uh, yeah, was not able to see out the ball uh, to the byline, and uh, yeah, he was trying to buy that foul, and uh, yeah, ref didn't buy it, and uh, yeah, he uh, he basically, you know, the ball didn't completely go out, Robinson is out of the play, Ferreira is able to find Paul Areola, uh, who pretty much, uh, from an oncoming Brad Guzan, uh, who's trying to put him off, I mean, he pretty much has a tap in to an empty net, and it's uh, it's frustrating because yeah, we we do sometimes get ourselves in trouble uh, playing out from the back, and this one uh, was a pretty good example of sometimes you gotta go long just to keep them honest because uh, yeah, we weren't necessarily doing that at the the correct moments, especially uh, that early, but. Yeah, we were able to find an equalizer 40 minutes later. And uh, Thiago Almada, he sent a ball over the top to the back post. That stand-up ball that he is so patently uh, known to do at this point. But Yakumakis, he's over there, able to rise over traffic. And like a fish, just like a trout, dive over everybody. And uh, yeah, gets a... Ridiculous header. I would say, yeah, the, the form on this is uh, quite good to be able to get it into the bottom right corner. And, uh, yeah, really, really well taken. Especially when uh, Yakumakis, he could have been sent off. He probably was pushing it a little bit. Uh, that first uh, yellow card where uh, I think it's a little bit harsh of a yellow, but he did... Uh, like pretty much get into the way of a, a jumping uh, player and so in that sense when that happens um, yeah it's a foul and it's definitely you're endangering the player but I don't know if he knew that much about it but it is uh, it is what it is I mean what, what was your thought on that yellow card Oh, this is the elbow to the the nose, was it? No, no, uh, that that was the one that was a uh, no was... call. But it was the when he jumped. Oh in right, front of, right, right. Uh, the jumping player, and uh, yeah, landed really awkwardly. To be fair, like the that. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. like he. Uh, I mean, he. I, I. Whenever a player does that, I tend to think that it is on the player uh, who is kind of canceling their jump in such a way where it upends the other player. You see it in other sports too, specifically in like in hockey. I've seen that a lot, and that gets called every time. It's a dangerous play to do. Um, sometimes it's kind of, you know, the players of two minds. They cancel the jump halfway through, or they pull back, or something like that. Sometimes they can't help it. It's like instinctual. They're just like, ah, I'm just never gonna make that, so they kind of back out of it. But it's too late. They get a little bit of jump in. The other guy goes full jump, and then gets sent over. Um, and yeah, that guy landed. I remember very awkwardly on his neck. I'm surprised. Yeah. There wasn't more damage there um so you know lucky for him that was um and so yeah i think it was a fair call um yorgos needs to be a little more careful these last couple games he's seeming a little bit more like center back yako than he is or like a number six a proper number six yako than he is like a striker so i think uh he needs to settle down a bit because we'd like to see him continue to see him in games yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah for sure i mean uh yeah he's properly getting stuck in that's for sure and um yeah, I mean, it's good sometimes, but, I mean, the way, the area that Yakumaki's got the yellow card, it's like, okay, we appreciate you tracking back, but uh, this is... He shouldn't be having to have to do yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, and it's a, it's a little too much, and uh, obviously, uh, with the elbow as well, that drew some blood on the lip uh, of, uh, of an FC Dallas player. It's pretty much, yeah, he could have reeled it in a little bit, uh, but... I, Luckily, he was able to stay on 
the ref was very inconsistent in this match and uh, it is what it is. I mean, it's like, yeah, he didn't choose to give him another yellow. Okay, fantastic. Yakumakis is able to make them pay. And uh, yes, uh, very, very key in the 44th minutes to uh, yeah bring it level. And uh, yeah, with that goal, it's a 13th for Yakumakis. And as well, that ties him uh, for the moment with Hani Mukhtar of Nashville FC, SC, of course, and Lucho Acosta of FC Cincy. But uh, in terms of Almada, he now has 14 assists, which ties him for Miguel Almiron and Julian Gressel for the club's single season record. And uh, with about, what, six, seven games left, six games? Uh, yeah, you would think that he would probably be able to break it. So uh, does that make him, uh, you know, the best passer in LA United history? I mean, maybe, maybe we'll find out. But, uh, you know, and uh, in terms of the goal, it was the 50th on the season for the five stripes as well. So, uh, yeah, definitely uh, well, well done. And into the second half, La Chenitze, Saba, he scored the go-ahead goal. Uh, he tried one uh, earlier where he didn't miss by much. It was uh, he was trying to, I think, go for the top left corner, but instead on this one, uh, he cut in like a prime Aryan Robin, and uh, yeah, pretty much skipped it into the bottom left corner. Uh, not really all that well, like uh, like hard struck rather, but very well struck, finessed into that bottom left corner, and. Uh, yeah, you know, it's definitely something that you love to see because the previous player that was playing, uh, that was a DP from the right wing that would shoot, usually skied it into row Z. So definitely, definitely uh, something that uh, it's just greater to see. And this, uh, this goal put us up to one. Uh, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, playing off of some space from Brooks Lennon. It's, uh, very, very well done. And, uh, yeah, Saba, you know, two goals in three games. He's looking every bit of the part of a hungry player that's wanting to show the league, the club, the fans, what he's made of. And, uh, yeah, I think he's showing a good bit that, uh, yeah, he is a player that, tries to make plays, make things happen, uh, isn't afraid to shoot, isn't afraid to get involved, nor as well get on that left side, uh, you know, get involved in some of the play. Uh, yeah, he's not just stuck into that, you know, that right wing and uh, always trying to beat his man on the dribble. He mixes it up, makes it dynamic, and uh, two goals in a week also ain't too bad. So, uh, but yeah, in terms of, uh, yeah, of those two goals, did you have a favorite? Oh yeah, definitely. Love, uh, Saba's left footed strike. That was class and much needed in a difficult time for mm -hmm. us in that game. Right. Um, I thought that that was the breakthrough we needed to really get a result here. Mm -hmm. And luckily, thanks to an offside call, it was. Um, and two more things. One thing I just wanted, I'm remiss to say, I think Hani actually did score this week uh, from the penalty spot. So he has regained the lead in the golden boot race over Yorgos um, with 14. And the second thing was that I'm like you were kind of getting at the dynamism of Saba on the right side is something very refreshing for us. Either you have you know, like we alluded to Aruju kind of taking it on his left, inverting in, and then skying it pretty much every time. Um, or you'd have someone like, you know, if like Lennon's playing down the right, or if you have uh, uh, like Jurgen Dam or something running down the right, all you'd have is just sprint down the right and lob crosses in. Now you have a player who seemingly can do both fairly competently, and he's a goal scoring threat. I'd like to see that continue. It'd be really good if it does. Um, you know, that guy's got a lot of spunk in him, and I'm excited to see if it maintains, if he can keep that up consistently. Because uh, if he can, that's a big difference from what we were sporting on that side of the field for a while now, for like two or three iterations of players coming through for us. So it's a big improvement. For sure, for sure. And it's uh, definitely, uh, like you said, much needed and as well, 
in the midfield, uh, we made some changes at the half. Uh, yeah, you had Sadich come off, uh, and you had Tristan Muyamba really start to make the difference, I think. Uh, that's that's really, I think, mainly what got us back in the game, uh, at least uh, you know in the aspects of getting a little bit more control, because we were getting bypassed a lot in midfield in this match. And uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, the lead, unfortunately, there seemed to be some kind of maybe preordained uh, kind of substitutions that were made, Saba being one of them, that came off. And Shonda Silva and Miguel Barry came on for uh, Yakumakis, of course, as well in Barry. But uh, yeah, it, just like seconds later, we uh, unfortunately... Uh, we concede FC Dallas. They equalize. And yeah, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, like it's a ball over the top. And Kamungo, he does really well to not only control it, chip it past Brad Guzan. But unfortunately, he can't elude the challenge from Brad Guzan. In which, uh, yeah, you know not to mess with Brad Guzan if you're Franco Escobar, if you're, uh, you know, other players. That's uh, LGP. That's, uh, yeah, basically, if you're near and around the box and Braguzan's coming for you, duck. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, Kamungo, he was able to get that goal and uh, really well taken. I mean, just the fact that he was able to, uh, yeah, just chip it from outside the box. Really, really well taken, and uh, I'm pissed. I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed at the type of goal that uh, we conceded there. Um, I think we were trying to probably p play a little bit of an offside trap there, but uh, not too good effect, unfortunately, uh, because that right side uh, just didn't, just didn't do the job. Uh, they didn't step up forward quick enough, and uh, yeah, it's just uh, something that, uh, yeah, it's two-two. It's it's too quick. It's too quick on uh, from a substitution. Um, sometimes that's just how it shakes out. But yeah, on the road you just can't concede that easily. And uh, you know they. Uh, I mean, it, it's really it's like a simple ball, just to you know. Uh, yeah, it, I'm I'm disgusted a little bit at times. Uh, but uh, yeah, and then there was uh, a. Appearing to be, anyway, a go-ahead goal in the 76th minute from Marco Farfan. And, uh, yeah, they were able to chase down a loose ball heading toward the corner, and they played it back into the box. But VAR, they called it back due to offside and uh, from the initial pass in. So, yeah, we were able to skirt some disaster after uh, yeah being 1-0 down, 2-0 up, and then maybe 3-2 down. Uh, very reminiscent of uh, another match that was played over the weekend, Arsenal Manchester United. Uh, yeah, very, very like kind of parallel type of games that uh, we experienced, uh, or me, I experienced as a fan of both of those teams. But uh, yeah, so I mean, in that we get a result on the road. Uh, yeah, of course, the other one we won two nil against Seattle. So yeah. Second consecutive match where we get a point or points. So it's uh, progress. <laughs> I mean, what, what do you think? It yeah. is. Absolutely. I mean, our away form with under Pineda is historically terrible. Mm -hmm. So we're making strides and trying to correct that. And that's good. And I think that comes down to a lot of um, the new signings. Um, and it's, it's just night and day. People keep using that term, night and day. Especially when Tristan is playing. And I completely agree. It is. It is, uh, for sure, for sure. And, uh, yeah, I think that outlines some of the clamoring that a lot of fans have been uh, really wanting for a really dynamic number eight. Because, yeah, if you don't have Tristan Muyamba, it, yeah, you know, it looks kind of dire in midfield. And, uh, yeah, we really need to be able to, uh, I think, shore that up. Mateus was set to, uh, he came on in the second half as well. And, he looked, uh, yeah, I mean, he looked, he looked to piece some things together, but I would say, yeah, ultimately it still is, yeah, I mean, if, we, I would say the the different, the different type of player that we would have in the middle maybe could have put things over the top, 
because yeah, if you can win that midfield battle, uh, especially late, I think you can, uh, yeah, you know, really do some things in this league. And unfortunately, imagine for a second, AJ. Huh. Imagine for a second, we move uh, Miyumba to a six and bring in a DP eight. Just imagine for a moment. How, what kind of world that would be? It, yeah, a <laughs> uh, a number eight scoring from midfield. Uh, yeah, we haven't uh, we haven't seen that in years. So it is uh, definitely I would fully welcome it for sure. And it's uh, it's something that needs to be done in the winter window, of course. But uh, yeah, uh, I think we all know the Achilles heel of this uh, LA United team, but. Uh, either way, anyway, uh, let's wrap this baby up. But yes, this is the last match before the international break. Uh, and our next match will be, of course, against Lionel Messi and Inter Miami at the Benz. So, uh, yeah, it will be. We hope to see everybody there. Exactly. It's going to be a party. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> a lot of people will be there. Uh, a lot of people have been probably also uh, frozen out from being able to get in and afford more so these tickets but uh it will be latin heritage night so uh those that will be in the stadium will be able to uh enjoy that aspect but uh yeah so that does it for the match review and it gets us into the news and the first bit of news is that tiago mata he makes the team with a match day bench uh of course with that assists for yakumakis as well so uh definitely well deserved doug roberson he uh, tweeted out that, or X posted, whatever we want to call it these days, uh, that there is no update on Jamal Tiare, our uh, backup striker that we signed in the summer window. There are now six games remaining, and he still has visa issues. So this is a this is a problem. I mean, uh, basically, uh, Doug Roberson he has posited that he wouldn't be surprised if Atlanta United canceled his contract if. Uh, we cannot get him in uh, soon. I mean, if this window, if not this window, then I would probably imagine so as well. That, uh, yeah, five, six games. He, I mean, he hasn't been able to train with the club either. And uh, I think we noticed this issue uh, pretty much during this week when, uh, yeah, on Wednesday, we didn't have really any weapons to put on when we really needed something. So it's, uh, yeah, definitely... A perplexing situation but uh, well what are your thoughts um, in terms of the visa thing you know I'm on the record saying it's not that um, worrying of a thing um, in terms of like you know what's going on there is the club doing their due diligence I think they are I think it's fine it's just what I think is the issue is that you know the reason I think he went to go play in Ligue 2 in France is because um, Senegal used to be you know a colony of France and in terms of a lot of the colonies of France, they kind of have very e like easier visa and travel in between kind of regulations and uh, agreements. Um, it's so thus, it might be significantly harder for him to have gone anywhere else. Thus why he probably ended up in France. Um, whereas trying to go somewhere like the United States, it's probably quite a you know big hurdle to jump, which I think is what we're seeing. Uh, some countries, you know, and I think I said this before, more difficult than others to get visas from. Uh, and I think Senegal is very high on the list of difficult nations um, for, you know, domestic issues with their country. Um, so I think that's probably something to do with it. And the fact that I think we mentioned in the, the live show that, um, you know, he doesn't really qualify as like an exceptional you know level of of worker that's coming to the united states so he has to go through even more hurdles like if he was a starting player mm -hmm. i was making like millions like he'd be on a fast track but it's not the case he probably has to go through a lot of the same stuff that a lot of us might have to so um you know it is what it is with that uh it, what you're saying about how you know he's not here to train with the team he's not he's only here for like what was it, maybe like five or six five or so games or something like that like at that point, why would the team kind of hamstring themselves um, for next season through another window um, when they could, you know, there could be roster um, changes in terms of like who and they, you know, like uh, how much money they can apply in different areas. And then, you know, perhaps his spot could be best filled in a different way 
because at this time things were you know uh, things are the way they are and they could change allowing some more you know affording more uh things you can do so it might put us in a difficult position if we have him and only here for five games he doesn't really play doesn't really do very much and all of a sudden we're kind of stuck with him for a bit because we signed him for x y and z amount of time whereas next season if we didn't have him we had that open spot could have done a lot more so there is some concern regarding that but i think that's kind of where it stops and ends yeah really really well said i mean uh yeah that, that pretty much recaps uh pretty much all of my thoughts on it and uh i mean it is that yeah during the live stream uh i mentioned that yeah because he is a backup striker it's a little bit difficult to see uh how the visa process would be streamlined for him and so it is ultimately this is the this is the pitfall and especially when you need to have an international roster slot for uh someone that isn't going to be playing a ton so yeah uh yeah, it'll, it'll be remain to be seen, but uh, yeah, I don't know if I have high hopes on this situation ending too too well. But uh, let's move on and let's get into the international break, in which uh, there are six players that have gotten the call up, and Thiago Amada, uh yeah, he has gotten the call up to Argentina, of course, uh, and Yorgos Yakomakis as well with Greece. U.S. men's national team for Miles Robinson, Luis Abram with Peru, and Saba Lapsenitze with Georgia, of course, and Efren Morales. He also gets a surprise call up to Bolivia. And for his troubles, he gets to face Lionel Messi in Argentina. So, uh, yeah, or Chaco Almada, or anybody else that's super talented on Argentina. So, uh, yeah, he will have a trial by fire for sure as he is still a teenager and uh, <laughs> playing for LA United 2 mostly. So, yep, Morales, good luck. Yeah. Like, it is going to be tough. But uh, but anyway, so, uh, yeah, it's going to be hopefully not too long of a two-week break uh, for most of us. Uh, yeah, we will be hoping that there will be no injuries because that's always the fear, the conundrum, and... Uh, why international breaks always suck. Because <laughs> we're just anxious the entire time. But, anyway, uh, so, uh, next bit of news is LA United's Academy. They announced its coaching staff and competitions. And uh, for the 2023-24 season, uh, it'll be the 8th season. And they will field 5 teams and compete across 2 leagues. Uh, it will be from the U13s to the U17s. And, uh, yeah, basically uh, some notable names would be that, uh, yeah, you have Kevin Kratz uh, kind of becoming the individual development coach. You have Richard Wolf, uh, who is an academy analyst. And uh, in which case, uh, yeah, more Wolfs in the Atlanta United uh, system. And, uh yeah, I mean, it's just like between Atlanta and Austin, we're just cornering the market on this family. But uh, <laughs> as well, uh, let's see. Anybody else that uh, is of note? Mm, I think uh, for most of us, we probably wouldn't recognize some of these other names. Uh, but uh, definitely, it's, uh, it's great to see uh, this academy uh, having a robust... Uh, kind of uh, staff as well and so yeah obviously the more that we can churn out from our own system the better because yeah uh, while we do have the 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 license or the uh, the purse strings are pretty loose for the front office it still is very good when you can bring out the likes of Caleb Wiley and players like him from inside the club so uh, definitely fantastic, uh, and we shall see if we can, uh, yeah, maybe create some more magic from the academy. But uh, last bit of news in LA Night 2, uh, they basically, they did what we couldn't do. <laughs> FC Cincinnati 2, uh, they earned a 3-1 victory at Fifth Third Bank Stadium, and uh, yeah, 
basically as well. They kept their playoff hopes alive. And uh, yeah, three separate players scored. Johnny Fortune, uh, he got his uh, first for LNI 2. Kareem Tamimi, he also scored. And Nick Firmino, he added his 15th goal of the season. Man, Nick Firmino, he... Uh, he probably deserves a spot in the uh, the roster next season if we can uh, keep him and do all that so that we need to. He'll probably be gone. I would, I would suspect he's probably going to be gone. Yeah, yeah. What? Why do you think? Why do I think? Because he's lighting it up uh, where he's at. Um, and I think people are going to look at him as a very good prospect going forward. Uh, and they probably want to develop him and then hopefully get something big from him. And I think he's capable of doing so. I mean... Yeah, I hope it'd be us, but I think, uh, you know, it would be a good bit of business for us to get uh, to move him on as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if we can get, uh, you know, maybe a couple couple hundred thousand dollars of GAM, wouldn't be too bad. Uh, then we might be able to, yeah, you know, fill out the rest of the roster with some, uh, some veteran players. But, yeah, I mean, it's also, I mean, yeah, he's not a spring chicken in... Uh, you know, the uh, MLS Next League, but he is relatively young-ish. And so I would be happy to keep him uh, as maybe an understudy for Tiago Amada to a degree of having somebody to be able to bring off off the bench that can, yeah, replicate some of what Almada can do. But, um, yeah. Well, that pretty much does it for the news and the entire show, except for the question of the day. And the question of the day is, should we cancel Jamal Tiare's contract? Let us know what you guys think in the comments below. Looking forward to what you have to say. But guys, that is the episode there and there. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe. Also, sign up for that Patreon, as mentioned before at the top of the episode. Uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing you guys there as well. And uh, yeah. yeah, and we have a two week break and uh, we might have some fun things coming up. Uh, so stay tuned on our discord and our Twitter for some updates on things that uh, we'll be doing hopefully during the break because uh, we're all going to be a little bored. Indeed, indeed. So, yes, join up into the discord. It's the best community around. And so, yeah, definitely. If you have some airings that you want to talk about, you want some therapy, you want to laugh a little bit, we got it all. We got the memes. We got the. It's uh, it's really uh, not biased. The best community around. So, and that's it for us today. Remember to subscribe to us if you haven't already. Share this episode and leave us a review and rating so we can pop up higher in your rankings. And for Michael, I'm AJ. Thanks so much for listening. Oh, oh, oh.